Now here's a neat find. Woodpecker has been at work. It's probably a pillow. Hello, my name is Bob Holtz. I have done 24 podcasts on birding for the Anoka County Parks. However, I never did an introductory one for birding, so today I'm going to do that as my final podcast for this series. Most people my age grew up on farms, always outdoors, either working or playing, but always in touch with nature. Most of us had no TV, no electronic games, no organized sports, and for that matter, no indoor plumbing. Uh, today, many young people prefer the indoors because that's where the outlets are and they can plug in their electronic gadgets. When you first become interested in birds and doing some birding, you're going to be struck by how many new uh, species of birds you will be finding. This is a clue that you're going to need some help. And there are uh, a little over 300 of species of birds that we can find in Minnesota. Assistance can be found from finding individuals that will help you, particularly other birders. And we have a lot of those in Minnesota and they're always very willing people to, uh, interested in helping other people learn. You'll need binoculars. Um, John James Audubon, whom you may know as a painter, didn't have binoculars. So he shot birds, mounted them, studied them, and then painted them. Today we have much better technology to help us do the identifying. And that includes field guides. There's a tremendous variety of field guides and you're not going to need all of them, that's for sure. But getting a few of them is going to be helpful. Um, you might eventually want a spotting scope. Um, that's for looking at things that are farther away. If you have bird feeders, that's going to draw birds right into your backyard and while they're feeding and fairly still you'll get some good views of them. Bird baths accomplish much the same thing. It also becomes interesting to make lists of what you see. You don't have to be listing for all kinds of places and things like some people do, but here are a few ideas. Some people keep a life list. That's what have I all seen in my life. You can also have a Minnesota list. And the goal there for people doing that is to see if you can find 300 species. Next step down would be a county list. And the goal there for Minnesota birders is to find at least 200 species in any county. You can make lists of other places you visit regularly. But one interesting one is your yard list. Uh, before, when I, the place I lived before I am now, I kept a list of all the birds I saw in my yard or over my yard. And that ended up after 29 years at 157. Now I live in a townhouse. I basically have no yard. So my yard list consists of the birds I see in my yard or see and hear from my yard. And uh, either way, you can make up your own rules on that one. Another thing is keep in mind that you need to go to a variety of habitats. Certain birds only live in certain places. So if you're only keep going to keep going to a lake, there are lots of things you're not going to see. Other helps can be, you know, go birding with other birders. They will give you some good information. But even going with small groups is very helpful. Many people lead birding field trips. Some of them do it f free of charge. Sometimes there's a small fee. The Anoka County Parks charges just $5 for a two to three hour bird walk. When it comes to sec uh, selecting binoculars, get some help from someone um, or go to a place like National Camera and they uh, will show you what's available and show you how to try things out. One thing you'll find is that it's going to be marked 735 or 840 or 1050. It's usually that second number is five times bigger than the first. 
The first tells you this is how many times it's going to magnify things, and the second number gives you a width in terms of how much light will be let in. Because as you get into higher powers, for example, you may see a field out there like this for the 7x, but only this much for the 10x and less light coming in, so you need that extra width. Also, on the objectives, usually there's in different techniques, but this one, the rolls up these cups. If you are not wearing glasses, you want those rolled up. If you're wearing glasses, as I am, then you want that rolled down. So. Lots of field guides. One of the first people that really got popular with a field guide was Roger Torrey Peterson. First edition came out in 1934, and he had a unique technique of putting little arrows pointed at spots on birds that said, hey, this is an important observation. There's a guide by Kaufman, which uses digital photos. Uh, there's not necessarily a preference between paintings and photos because either one can be touched up and different lighting conditions give you different situations too. There's a National Geographic book. It covers all of the United States, whereas the Peterson book I showed you was only Eastern. So you get a little more information per species in that. And then there is the Stokes Field Guide. There's a couple by the name of Stokes that put this together. And as we said before, you know, make sure you go to different habitats. Other things that you might want to be aware of are the bird feeders. What kind of seeds are you going to want to get? If you can only get one feeder, I'd recommend you get a black oil sunflower feeder. There's also safflower seeds. They're very good, uh, loved. Niger are also or thistle seeds for the finches. And in the wintertime, definitely use suet. It's a very high energy food because it's fat. And fat for birds is just like it is for us. We get twice the calories roughly from fat as we do from anything else. Now let's get into bird identification. A basic rule of birding is ears before eyes, eyes before binox, binox before field guides. And you might also want to, as some people do, make some notes and sketches even before you go into field guides. And we say eyes, uh, rather ears before eyes, because it is most likely a little better chance that you're going to hear a bird before you see a bird. As a matter of fact, sometimes you hear birds and you can't see them. And that's where it comes in very handy to be able to identify birds by their voices. Here are some things to note when you are identifying birds. You see something new, what is it that you concentrate on? One is color. If you find, for example, a little warbler, and you note it's got a lot of yellow, it's got a lot of black. And if that's all that registers, when you go to a field guide, you're going to be a bit bewildered because lo and behold, you find, wow, yeah, it's most likely a warbler, but there are lots of them that have black and yellow. So where was the black and yellow? In most of the field guides, as I'll show you in Stokes, you have a photo an outline of a bird with all different parts of the bird being labeled. And if you know where the crown, eye ring, belly, breast, wing bars, etc., are located, that's going to make it much easier for you to remember where color was and whether it's on the species you think it is or not. Another thing that will be helpful is to know the size of a few common species. If someone asked you, how many inches long is a sparrow? You might say, oh, three, maybe four. But the numbers you look at in the book are going to say they're five and a half to six for the most part. 
The difference is bird measurements are taken from the tip of the bill to the tip of the tail. And we tend to look at things and look at body size. So sparrows, five and a half to six inches. Robins, which we all know, nine and a half to 10 inches. Blue jays, nearly 12 inches. And crows, 18 to 24. There's a little bigger spread there, but it's a big bird that we know. Now, if you find a new bird and you say to yourself, that bird's a little bit bigger than a robin. In other words, when you go to the field guide then, you ought to find a bird that looks like what you saw and is listed as being a little bigger than 10 inches. So if you say, ah, that's it, then you look at the size in the field guide and it says six and a half to seven and a half inches, probably not the right one. It's not impossible, but it might not be. Songs and calls of birds are also very important. We have an, some situations where we have several birds that sound very much alike. Chipping sparrow, swamp sparrow, pine warbler. Those three sound a lot alike. Habitat, though, tells you something about which one it might be. And you also have to learn how they really do sound. Chipping sparrows are fairly common, so if you get that one down, then you might want to remember that the pine warbler is a little bit more musical, and he's not usually found in your backyard. He's going to be out by some pine trees. The swamp sparrow lives in marshy areas, and my recognition technique for him is he sounds like a chipping sparrow on steroids. In other words, it's a more heavy-duty staccato to his song. The reverse of that is <clears throat> we have five small flycatchers in Minnesota. They look very much alike. They're very difficult to tell, particularly if they're not sitting perfectly still. If we turn in reports as we do in our Minnesota birding organization and we don't indicate that that little flycatcher sang, it doesn't count as an official observation. But when those birds sing, no doubt about which one it is. They look almost identical. They sound extremely different. So the knowing songs makes quite a difference. And you can do that. You have friends, I'm sure, who call you. They don't have to say who it is. And even if you didn't have caller ID on your phone, you'd know who it was just because you recognize their voice. Make birds your friends and you'll be able to recognize their voices too. Body shape comes into play. Thrush, let me use thrushes as an example. In Minnesota, robins, well everywhere, robins are thrushes also. So if you know that general body shape, large eyes, a certain kind of outline to the bird, when you go to a foreign country, you may be able to look at a bird and say, ha, thrush. I'll give you an ex example of that. In July of 2013, I was in Ecuador. We arrived there in the dark of night. Next morning, I being a fairly early riser, I was up before breakfast was served. I started walking around the grounds a bit and I saw a new species. It said to me, thrush. I went to my field guide for the birds of Ecuador, looked at it in the thrush section, and there he was. First page I looked at, the great thrush. Behavior also is helpful. We have a flycatcher called an Eastern Phoebe here. When he flies, he tends to go out, grab an insect out of the air, and come back and land on the same branch. And then on top of that, wag his tail a couple times. Rarely sideways, but often and most likely yeah, the vertical. There's also a thrush called a hermit thrush that does some tail wagging, but it's done differently. He drops his tail and raises it slower than it went down. Drops and raises slowly. So little things like that will help you identify birds. 
even watching them walk on the ground. Different birds walk differently. Watch a robin once, for example. He's standing still, his head's up fairly high. Wants to walk, tips that head forward, and takes off. The British speak of the jizz of the bird, G-I-S-S. -S. Stands for general impression of size and shape. That's helpful. It's kind of like what I just told you about with thrushes. But I think adding behavior to that uh, category of things is very helpful too. So if you want to see the other podcasts, and I should have had something written out for you, but you would go to www.anokacounty.us forward slash 866 forward slash wargo, W-A-R-G-O, dash nature dot center. And on the left, click on Bird Watching with Bob, and you'll find these 25 podcasts. Thanks for listening, and have a great time birding.